All right, people, we're here with episode eight of Talking Thrones. We're this close to the end, Pat. We've almost done a full season. It's honestly kind of crazy. But it's here with episode eight entitled The Pointy End, the third of five episodes directed by Daniel Minahan, written by, famously, the first episode written by the great George R.R. Martin himself. Pat, you have any words going into this episode? Listen, I know I'm not the only one in the uh, talking TV audience that is wondering what the hell would have happened to that stable boy that they told Arya to attack with the other end. Right? You know? <laughs> so, well, um, that old man, that, 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 that brings up so many bad ideas potentially yeah, that, of where that, that could have gone. Scene. That would have been really something else interesting. All of that and more on tonight's episode of Talking Thrones. Stay tuned. Episode 8, we've got two episodes left of Season 1, our debut season of Talking Thrones. Just First off, I just wanted to say thanks for sticking with me for this long. <laughs> That's well, honestly hey. impressive. Chris has like built up a tolerance because he's been with me for two years now, but like you're still kind of like a recent addition by that time frame, so just thank you for that. Oh yeah, listen, Dom, we're, we're having fun, we're uh, dealing with technical issues here and there, which none of the audience gets to see, but uh, hey, we're figuring things out on the back end, and that is something that I'm glad to mess around with. Yes. So for the most part, I, you know, let's jump right in because yes. my, my biggest question of this episode, <laughs> Tom, is, you know, everything's going down there. Yes. You know, the Lannisters are killing off the Stark guards yes. and, and people. It and is everything. pandemonium. This episode and, is like the fallout from Ned's utter... And stupid yeah. mistake. And so Arya is looking through all the, the luggage that's knocked over. It's like, where's Needle? Where is it? I need it. And and the stable boy comes up from behind, and it's like, I'm going to turn you in. And she basically turns around and stabs him and then says, stand back. <laughs> you know? It's like, damn. You Didn't, know? It doesn't even give him a chance. doesn't even yeah, give him it, a it, second hesitation. Pointy in first, uh, ask questions later. So yeah. I guess that's where the episode gets its name. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and obviously refers back to the statement that John gave her in the second episode when he left, when she said, what, is, what do you do with it? And she said, stick him with the point yet. And obviously, like, she's taken that completely to heart. It just shows that maybe there was something wrong with this girl, like, from the start, possibly, as far as the path that she would go down. Well, I think, you know, the beauty of this season is the fact that, you know, you had, like, Robert... And he's talking with his men about, you know, what is your first kill? You know, how significant it was it and all this stuff. And this is sort of world building. But then, you know, a few episodes later, here's Arya and this is her first kill. And you could just see it in, in you know, her eyes. Like, yeah, it's kind of miserable. It's it's yeah, it's not like exactly. it's not like kind of like the satisfying, glorifying thing. It's kind of but, a heart wrenching experience. that kind of cripples you and scars you for life. Yeah, but she doesn't have time to process it because she's got to run away. So it's right. It's it's basically it, a survival it's, tactic. It's, yeah, it's it's traumatizing, but she doesn't have time to let it do that. So, uh, you know, over the next episode specifically in, in the final episode of season one, uh, we're going to really see like, you know, some trauma in Arya's uh, character. Starting yes, to indeed. Especially with what she comes to witness. But yes, let's dive in. As I mentioned before, again, this is episode eight of season one entitled The Pointy End. This is the third of five episodes directed by Daniel Minahan and the first of four episodes that George R. R. Martin himself wrote for the show. If you'll remember, Back to our premiere episode when we talked about how the debut, uh, when Martin, Benioff, and Weiss negotiated the deal, it was that Martin would write one episode per season, and this was his first one. And when we open up, this episode is like, to kind of sum it up, is a transition episode while at the same time being like an interesting fallout. I kind of like this, these types of episodes in television when they can like kind of use like the fallout event to like lead into the continuing story to push for the finale. It's always kind of really interesting, and Game of Thrones was really good at that at one point. Yeah, well, this starts off like, you know, hey, all, all these murders and, like, death. And, yeah, 
Um, if you're a Stark you know, in King's Landing, you you don't have a chance. They kill everyone. They kill they, they kill Sansa Septa. They kill the regular horse people. They kill you know they try to kill Sirio, but obviously that death happens off screen. They just if you're related yeah, to a well, Stark, you are dead. The first sword of Bravos <laughs> is probably one of the best characters in the show, and yes, you know they kill him off camera, so there is hope yes. that he actually succeeded yeah. in that. Sword our, fight. Our, our death count is going to have a field day this episode. Yeah, so maybe maybe the first sword of Bravos uh, gets his own spinoff show, like showing what he did for the other seven seasons. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they did confirm, I don't know if you know, because there is a, a in the next episode or two, um, there is like some heads on pikes and whatnot. I don't know yeah. if you saw the. the, uh, the I I, I don't believe there. I don't believe we saw his. Oh, so there's still hope. Yeah, yeah there is still hope. I don't I don't even remember if in the books his head was there, but then again, because he was trying to torture Sansa. Not Arya, because that was Joffrey doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah at that particular point. But you right. know, for the most part, it's it's like this side character that is you know really well well played, um, and it also is it's just a great character with a wooden sword. He's able to take out all these like guards, three three and, guards. Yeah, and it's it's like you know even with his sword, his wooden sword cracked in half when the main you know leader of that guard troop is is taking him on. You know, there's there's a little bit of chance. You know, there's hope that he'll actually uh, rue the day because you know he's just that good of a sword fighter. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there there is a lot that happens in this episode. I think we just need to get into it really because yeah, well, there, there, know, there's like four different storylines ep- storylines going or, on like, here. I'm done. You know, my, my favorite part was the, that sword fighting in the beginning of the episode. Uh, I don't know what you know. What strikes you, man? What, what came up? Yeah. Next? So, so obviously we have Varys visiting Ned in the dungeons. Uh, oh after yeah. After Arya him, and kills the table boy. That's that's a really good scene. It's a really yeah. well shot scene. I think it adds a lot of context. It kind of continues to confused Ned as far as, you know, where certain characters' loyalties lie, and he's still trying to figure out, like, kind of, even now, even with his kind of imprisonment and eventual kind of move towards a certain fate, he is still trying to figure out what's going on. He still has no idea. And Varys comes to him and tries to offer him some solace in his pain, even though he can't really offer him any sort of freedom, right? Yeah. And it's kind of... The stuff with Varys, like, specifically... You know, who is he serving in that scene? Like Cersei basically. In that scene himself. In that scene himself. No, no. He he says like, you know, uh, Ned asks him like, who are you serving? He says the realm because someone has to. And that's a truthful statement, I think, from his character. But at the same time, the whole point of these uh, vignettes with Varys and Ned Stark, um, you know, in this episode and I believe in the next episode, basically it's convincing him to – you know, confess and and do what Cersei wants and therefore he could be kept alive, Um, you know, and basically is he really doing this, you know, he's protecting the realm, but what he thinks is best for the realm is serving Cersei in this particular moment. Right, exactly. No, exactly. And in this case, and uh, yeah, and, and, and the thing about Varys is that Varys has always been kind of, a mysterious and elusive character, right? But I feel like also he's one of those guys that we haven't gotten like that much characterization for yet. But obviously the thing of interest comes in, of course, when later on both in the books and the show it is revealed that he's secretly working for the Targaryens as is revealed um, when with, with the conversation with Illyrio that Arya overheard in previous episodes before. So as far as other storylines in this episode go, I just wanted to kind of like kind of cut to some other vignettes that happened majorly before we get to the main storyline, obviously, which is the direct fallout and the reaction of Winterfell to the events in King's Landing. So we have up at the wall, obviously, we have the fallout after uh, John and Sam take their vows uh, and uh, Ghost brings back a direwolf, an undead hand. Um, they end up bringing two corpses inside the oh, wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bodies. Yeah, yeah the like, bodies. Yeah. And Sam, you know, proving that how smart he is, he's just like, yo, where's the, where's that smell from the rot? Mm-hmm. And it's like, these bodies are not smelling. And, uh, I think, you know, that's one of those things where Sam, uh, comes in as a coward, you know, John has to protect him and it creates all this great tension. Uh, but now we're starting to see that Sam is actually well read and he's going to bring all the book smarts to the characters in the wall. Um, you know, probably going forward in, in most of the uh, plot lines, if I remember correctly. Yes, indeed. He kind of becomes like the, the wisdom soothsayer, like kind of the kind, kind of almost like the um, the beginning of the old bard character, basically like the keeper yeah. of knowledge. 
it, it's weird to me, like, you know, his father sends him to the wall because, you know, I don't want you inheriting all my lands and whatnot. You know, wouldn't it have made more sense to just send him to be a maester? Like, he, he yeah. probably wouldn't take over your it lands have, either. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it would have kind of been the best for all worlds. Yeah, it, like, at least you he could have brought some, like, respect and honor to your name if, if that was your concern. You know, wouldn't it be better to have someone that's a maester in the family than someone that basically that could is, potentially inherit you know, your lands? That's watch? right. That's disappointing. Right. Exactly. Because yeah. especially with like kind of the a relative instability of the Night's Watch as the series goes on. So obviously they bring the bodies inside. John is in prison after Sir Alistair tries to comment on him being the son of a traitor after the news reaches the wall of of Ned's imprisonment and supposed yeah. betrayal. Well, it's it's the whole idea is like again, it's John took this oath, but he's still like so youthful and hasn't really gotten the uh, oath wrapped around his head. The, you right, know, you you are dedicated for life to this oath. Right, he's um, still feeling some know. familial bonds there. Yeah, so he's ready to rush off, and it's like, no, dude, like you better stay here. You better not do anything stupid. And um, you know, for the most part, I guess it's a good thing he was locked in his quarters because he hears some stuff going on, and uh, you know, his ghost basically sort of uh, leads him to Mormount's chamber, and inside is um, I don't know what we call him. What do we call him? Like, so we. So this dead, is officially White Walker. What? what so we're gonna get into our. This is gonna be our transition into the Gotchaverse segment a little bit early because this is the subject of today's episode we finally see up close and personal the thing that was hinted at in the opening sequence of the whole show all the way back in that first episode winter is coming we see the undead zombified corpses of people resurrected by the white walkers up close and personal undead men with and that are frozen with blue eyes known as whites, basically. They are completely invulnerable. They could basically attack anyone at will. As is later revealed, the only things that we are able to be used to stop them are dragon glass and fire. But the basically because basically <coughs> The way, of course, that the ancient legend goes with the White Walkers is that the White Walkers rose the ones that they specifically killed. Almost like a where, like a combination of. It's interesting because it dives into the history of zombies predating kind of sci fi territory back when they were like kind of the source of like voodoo, basically. Basically, like there would be a lot of voodoo, black, a uh, lot of bad black and white voodoo movies that would use like zombies as the antagonist, basically. And that seems to be primarily the ins- a, a little bit of inspiration for them. But the other inspiration. Obviously, seems to come yeah, you, from. You, you think the inspiration could have been Stargate Atlantis because the, the bad guys, the bad guys possibly. in there are the the rife and uh, a wraith, and um, you know they kind of look like the White Walkers to be honest. Um, but you know, obviously George R. 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 Martin probably wasn't watching Stargate, or maybe he was. Maybe you know? he was. Honestly, he was a sci-fi writer, so around that time, oh, so oh, it would make sense actually if he when, was. When, when did when did he write these books? Uh, he wrote these books in the early ni- starting in the early nineties. Ah oh, man, you know I think Sarge is early two thousand, so you know. Ah, uh, so it could have been just just around that time period. It oh, well, been. It, it, yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm a sci-fi fan, so maybe I'm being a little too hopeful here. <laughs> yeah, I have no, but that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm surprised you haven't you haven't known about more of his stuff. Yeah, because basically this all stems from the fact that Cersei had Sansa write a letter that she that she sends out to all corners of the realm, basically, in order to get everyone together. So Catelyn gets the letter in the Eyrie, approaches Lysa, gets angry at her for keeping it from her. Lysa yeah, says that she's the, staying in the Eyrie and not going anywhere, and Catelyn kind of comes to this understanding that her sister is kind of not to be relied on anymore. Yeah, so she her takes sister her, is basically crazy. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They, they have 100% in all the episodes this season made that abundantly clear. You know, it, it's it's so campy, the whole, you know, eight year old still getting breastfed. And, and in this scene, it's it's hard to watch just him sort of like playing at the strings of her, her dress and, and complaining that he's hungry. And it's like, oh, my God, there is something wrong with this uh, child. Yeah, it's... And, 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 you know, Liza always talks about like, oh, the knights will stay here to protect our Lord. And she's talking about her son, but it's like that's a little bit of overprotection and you know, he's not going to be, as we find out later in the series, capable of doing anything. No, not at all. In fact, he's so useless that he literally ages over like the course of three years for the finale to the point where we don't even recognize him and it somehow allows him to live. So I guess in that case, kudos for him being like one of the only surviving characters on the show. 
But um, oh, yes, I, I guess I guess I didn't re- uh, recognize. Uh, <laughs> no <laughs> one did. No one did. It was it, the two big things of 2019. The kids that no one recognized that they forgot grew up. Him in the Game of Thrones finale, and the kid from Iron Man three at Tony Stark's funeral in Avengers Endgame. Wait, wait. So, every- he, he, so literally, he's in the final sequence. You know? Yes, he, he's at the he's at Tyrion's trial when Tyrion the prisoner makes Bran king. Yeah, when, yeah, when Tyrion the prisoner decides the fate of all the world, it's the biggest. Uh, anyway, uh, don't get me started on that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, Cat leaves the Eyrie, but we come to the folk. Uh, Tyrion also, as well, is walking through the Eyrie with Bronn. Yeah, promises the, to pay Bronn. Hill tribes, man. Yeah, the scenes with the Hill tribes. We finally get into these guys. They, these guys are around for too short of a time. They're only around for two seasons, and but they are ultimately fantastic. Basically, Tyrion. And Bronn are attacked by the local tribesmen of the Eyrie, known as the Hill Tribesmen. But of course, Tyrion manages to gain their allegiance with his silver tongue. And yeah, this well, is just k- kill this Bronn whole sequ- and this- uh, basically let the little man dance. And yeah, this, this- like, no, 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 keep us both. <laughs> this whole sequence is just comedy gold. Just good. I, I wonder if the- I, I got to wonder what episode Peter Dinklage submitted for his Emmy that he won for. But I have to assume that it was this one because he is just on all levels of incredible in this. Yeah. You know, it, it's one of those things where this is where we start seeing Tyrion, you know, play the, uh, you know, uh, logistics strategy game. And, you know, he's able to convince uh, the, the, you know, the trial by combat. He's able to get out of there. Now he's basically convincing these hill tribes to take him back to, uh, you know, Tywin's uh, camp, you know, battle camp. Yes. And we start to see. Uh, him really, you know, start to manipulate people, you know, and, and really to his benefit, um, you know, and to a, a really high degree. And I think, you know, as we'll see in the next couple episodes, this is uh, how he convinces his father that he's actually a, a smart mind uh, worth being utilized by the Lannister family. Yeah, this is Tyrion's moment to shine, ultimately, because he manages to convince all of these people seemingly out of the blue to follow him and pledge them to his father for service, and also kind of starts to at least make his father, let his father know that he is a presence to be reckoned with, ultimately. So, in order to kind of wrap that up, basically, John um, also ends up, uh, what's it called? Oh, wait. Hold on. I got it. Um, sorry. I got confused with my storylines there for a second. Uh, so John ultimately discovered that he could burn the whites alive in Essos, obviously. Oh, yeah. We we're have, going back to that. It, like, yeah, it's... The, the worst shot ever. He, like, Mormont's holding the lamp like this, and John just palms it. Like, he's LeBron palms James. It. And it's like, like, what? And it takes, like, three seconds for him to burn his head. He grabs yeah, it, come on. it, like, and it's like, like dude, like, come he, on. He, he can't just, like, you know, grab the handle and rip it out of more. And In the books, he like, accidentally lights himself on fire and loses use of that hand for, like, weeks. Oh, God. You know, maybe that would have been a better storyline, but, like, it, it was very awkward in terms of the staging. Yeah. Um, which, you know, that's fine. It's forgivable. We can, you know, maybe I'm just, like, since this is the second time I've, I've watched this in, in like two weeks, um, you know, maybe it's just me nitpicking, but he throws it, he burns the the zombie. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the end of that. They actually know how to kill those zombies and, and that. They yes, exist. indeed. It's a thing that is established in this season, which I, which I think is really cool that, that that that's a through line that continues through to the end, even if, oh man, so, so many different through lines that were just abandoned ultimately at the end. But Hey, that's the thing. I'm still coming up with like something special that we're going to do for the final six episodes this is going to be like something big where we just have to like roast them at like each point in each of the final sex but we have one quick scene with Daenerys and Essos ultimately it's not it's ultimately again like a demonstration show and also a transition into where kind of her arc will wrap up tragically oh, at the end this, of this season oh, this, this, is, it, this scene is rough this scene is rough but it's awesome it's, it's okay. at the same time so how Daenerys ends this season to me has always hasn't sit right with me and it's it's just this is the beginning of the end and it's like obviously her character uh, comes back strong in the second season but for the most part it's you know they're in a village. It's being conquered. Uh, I think this is the moment where Drogo is like, I'm going to get you uh, that throne. Yes. It's like he decides that that's something he's going to do for yeah, her. Yeah, they're conquering villages along the way, though, basically. Yeah, exactly. And they're looting and pillaging, doing Dothraki things. Yeah, so they, they basically get up to this like is it a witch village or it's just a you know no i think it's just a, i think it's or... just a regular village that just happens to have the witch in it that's a local mice yeah got, got you so it, it's there's so much weird with it because um you know 
Daenerys is like, oh no, don't assault those women. But it's like, you know, as we learn later in this plot line, it's, uh, all those women have been like attacked numerous times by the time Daenerys, you know, even notices them. Yes. And it's like, no one sort of consults her like, Hey, like, you know, we've actually already brutalized these women. Uh, you might not want to trust them when they say they can heal your husband. Like, like, how does this, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, more Mount is there. He's a knight and, you know, he has to have some sort of medical knowledge and he can't treat Drogo's wound. Like, it just doesn't make sense that the, the woman that you just victimized, you're going to trust to heal Drogo after that incident with one of his men. Yeah. Uh, that leads him to have a, a cut on his chest. Yeah. It just Which seems is, like that that's a big thing that ultimately so I remember how I said at the beginning that season one was almost beat for beat what happened. Uh that is not how Drogo got the wound in the books. That okay, was a thing so that the show changed and it was very, very over dramatically done. Basically he he basically gets a wound in the fight while they're conquering villages, basically. That's what happens. And then when it's basically like when he gets back to the village, it's kinda like they don't really have time to find a doctor and Miri Mazdur happens to be there because they've or Daenerys has already demanded her be sit, given to her. And then she goes to treat Drogo. And this it's like, oh, just so, this one of one of Drogo's blood riders just wanted to get up in the fight and they just needed an yeah, excuse to like you know, kind of show it, off Jason Momoa fighting because they didn't have uh, the budget to do an actual fight like that. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where I, they could have planted the seeds for this sequence a lot earlier in the season. Like maybe they capture the village and, you know, Daenerys protected her and, and she becomes a little bit of a, a side character for like an episode or two. And, you know, then it's like, OK, we as the audience sort of since she's been with us for an episode or two can trust her as well. You know, it's one of those things when I'm watching, it's like, no, Danny, don't do it. You know, don't trust yeah. some stranger. Yeah. There, you know, it's, it's like, have it's, you never heard of the term stranger danger before? Yeah. It, I, don't, I don't know if I would go that far, but you know, for the most part, I just felt <laughs> totally like this is going to end bad for Drogo and ultimately Danny, because he, who is this woman? You haven't vetted her. It's, Clearly, she has a gripe, you know, with the fact that you destroyed her village. You know, it, it's not going to go well to allow her to sort of be your medical staff. You know, yeah. it, it just so I think it's, and then, it's a dumb move. It's an amateurish move. And it's ultimately the beginning of the end for Danny and the beginning of one of many, yeah, many painful it, lessons that she'll it, learn along the it, way. Danny, Danny, basically, from my point of view up until the final scene of this season, everything between now and that moment that we get at the end of the season before the credits hit basically is terrible. You yeah. Know, Danny, it's, it's, there's only one redeeming factor for the, her for the rest of the season. Yeah. Even if the fight itself was cool, the fight itself between Drogo oh, and, yeah, his, yeah, and, and, his, the, yeah, the and fight, his blood rider was cool. Yeah. Jason Momoa, this is the last we'll see of him. <laughs> You yeah. know, doing a good job for Game of Thrones because for another for another uh, eight years until Aquaman. Yeah, ba well, I don't. I wouldn't go that far. I'm just saying for Game <laughs> of Thrones. Um, you know, but like the the well, the main just thing Jason is, Moa's career ultimately, even though it's supposed to kind of take off after Game of Thrones, kind of lapses. He's in a bad Sylvester Stallone movie, and he's in, he's in a lot of bad movies up until he finally breaks out in Aquaman in the DC movies. Those have ultimately yeah. been the best thing for him, which is kind of crazy well, to say, especially given how good he is in this in this show. Yeah, I think he, you know, he, I think he grew in popularity. He started doing movies because, you know, for the most part, I believe he was a mainly a television actor before this. Yeah, he was. Uh, and this was sort of like a big role that allowed him to transition into movies. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I don't like, you know, his final performance, <laughs> you know, in the, yeah. the final well, episode. Well, he doesn't, but, he uh, doesn't we'll, really we'll have, have, he doesn't really have that much to do with the final episode. So yeah, we'll get to that when we get to it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Let, let's get know, to the main focus. Let, let's just say oh, yeah. he, he's in his prime during this fight scene uh, for his, for his ability yeah. in the show. So we got Tyrion, we got Jon, we got Danny. So let's move on to the focus, ultimately, of this episode. Our focus character tonight, ultimately, one Rob Stark. Ned has been arrested. It is officially, the, the call has been sounded by Sansa, uh, through by Cersei through way of Sansa to Rob to come to the capital and surrender, ultimately. The and Rob. The capital, The capital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's funny you mentioned Slip of the tongue because... there. Well, you know, I, I, I because, basically, you know, because King's Landing is famously known for its smell caused yeah, by its yeah, terrible yeah, plumbing yeah. system. 
And, and uh, you know, I'm a little bit ahead. I, I started watching the season two, and and there is a reference to how bad it smells. So yeah, you know, when you say that, it's it's kind of fits the show. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. He basically, we're we're talking about Rob. Yes. So Rob ultimately gets the letter coming to telling him to come to King's Landing to surrender. And Rob says, oh, if I'm going south, I'm, I, I got to get the boys together. And he ultimately tells Maester Lewin, let's see what the North men's uh, loyalty to our father means. And he summons them to battle ultimately in order to go south and begin the conflict to free Ned ultimately. It's crazy to me still how this kind of starts off as like a tiny little micro rebellion basically that breaks out into like a full scale war with like just betrayal on all sides. It just, it speaks to the power of Game of Thrones storytelling ultimately. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I think, you know, the whole idea that, um, Okay, so Rob is bringing his bannermen. They're ready to go to war, you know, for Ned. And, you know, I, at this point, you know, it's really just a misunderstanding. And through the scene with Varys in this episode and the next episode, it's kind of like, you know, the Lannisters know they got to smooth it over. Um, you know, so it, it's interesting to see the mechanism of war start to take place here. Uh, and I think, you know, once the bannermen come in and they're at that dinner and, um, you know, who is this, who is Rob? Ultimately, that's what the bannermen are asking. Why should we follow Rob? You know? And, and yeah. Dom, what are your thoughts on? No, he gives them, I, I, I think Rob, that how Rob handles himself. I, I, I think ultimately this is Rob's coming into his own. This is Rob realizing that he's no longer a boy. He has to be a man. I think the scene where Kat arrives and he, for one second, gives away. Uh, like he's the boy again and then he has to put on the cold exterior and become the man and he he's not he, he can't even embrace her until everyone else is out of the tent because he realizes he is now the head of the family he has to show strength kind of he in a weird way is the Michael Corleone albeit you know kind of without the you know him being a murderer on that on, on that front he because you know he just becomes like kind of a uh, soldier and later on a king in his own right ultimately it's a lot of, Rob's arc is ultimately tragic because it begins with such promise ultimately although it is it is, of course, him being thrust into an impossible and futile situation and one that ultimately he does not walk away from. But the interesting thing about Rob is that he he did and did not act like act like Ned. He was always a man of action. He was always trying to stay one step of his enemies. He won every battle famously, as is said, but ultimately he didn't see the writing on the wall. He didn't see which advisors were turning against him until it was too late. And unlike Ned, which Ned's feels so much more obvious because it feels like Ned had warning signs the entire time, Rob's, the thing that makes Rob's death at the end so tragic is the fact that he ultimately didn't see it coming because he never had a chance, ultimately, because Roose Bolton was so cunning that way. Yeah, but he, you know, basically, I would say that Rob, his downfall happened to be the fact that he wouldn't honor the whole marriage agreement that he yes. that, he falls in love, you know, uh, in season two, um, you know, I think right season two, you know, it, season two, yeah. So uh, basically, because he's he's unwilling to honor his thing, that leads to the sort of treachery that ends up befalling Rob. But I I think one of the things that is very interesting is, you know, in season one, you know, there's characters like, you know, Theon is not so great. You know, Rob's not so great. Uh, Arya is pretty much, I think, a favorite for a lot of people. Uh, I think Tyrion, you know, obviously he's not a Stark, but like Tyrion's a favorite. Like Rob is a character that I don't think is really anyone's favorite. Yeah. Until this moment when he starts bringing the North to war right. and, you know, uh, basically in the next two episodes, he gets a couple victories under his belt. The fact that he proves that he's somewhat of a good warlord is something that makes, you know, elevates him, uh, probably to one of the best characters, uh, this show has, uh, you know, and I would say that probably lasts throughout the whole second season. Yeah, I agree with that. Ultimately, Rob, um, I, I think one of my favorite scenes also, I mean, there's a couple of great scenes with Rob, obviously having to prove himself. Uh, the scene with the great John Umber, obviously the leader of the Umber Force is one of the many northern houses. <coughs> uh, some of the others, obviously, that we hear of, you know, throughout the series, Glover, Hornwood. Um, yeah, uh, the, well, you're talking about the one that happens this episode, right? With Umber? Yeah, it, yes, when... when yeah, basically, he he complains just about his placement in the line, and then he threatens to desert, and then Rob's dire wolf, Grey Wind, comes up and attacks him and bites off his fingers, and Rob gives him a cold, 
Um, compl- and Rob gives him a cold proclamation, obviously, uh, a, a cruel joke in order to give him to cover it up, that he only meant to cut his meat by pulling a blade on him. And then later on, when they catch the spy, obviously, when they're planning their first attack, but Rob decides to let him go, basically giving him a word saying that all of his men that are coming for Tywin Lannister's forces, it seems like an amateurish move, but later on it is revealed to actually have been a genius ploy showing that Rob, despite being young, does have a mind and a stra- and a surprisingly good knacking strategy for battle. It really is interesting because I think that had he survived, I think Rob actually would have act- would have been a really good ruler. Yeah, I think you know he they set him up like that's the thing about this whole entire series is that uh, there's moments that this could end at any time. Like it basically is a spiral downwards into the depths, and you know. Basically, we'll talk about it, you know, next uh, episode, uh, episode nine. But basically, Joffrey's decision, you know, to not honor sort of the behind closed doors deal between Cersei and Ned basically is what makes this war between Rob and the Lannisters happen. And, you know, we also talk about uh, Liza, where she says uh, the Knights of the Vale will not leave. You know, if they had left and, you know, basically joined forces with Rob, that would have really put the pressure on the Lannisters to back down even more. So yeah. there's a lot of like specific, you know, things that happen that basically let this spiral out of control and get to the point where the realm is unstable. And, you know, I think, you know, Ned, before he gets captured in the last episode, he writes that letter directly to Stannis, basically telling him about the bastard children. Yep. And literally in the nick of time as well. Yeah. And, and that's going to have like a really big impact, uh, in, in the, you know, start of the second season. Yes. And for the most part, I will say that, you know, all this messages, you know, with the, the Ravens and sending them out, um, you know, all the seven kingdoms, like these people are gossip hounds. They yes. basically just want their business it's out a, in the open. It's, <laughs> su- it's surprising, honestly, because even though Westeros has no social media, it is fascinating kind of how fast they receive news. I'm like, damn, like that Raven service is just really that good, isn't it? Yeah, but like they're, you know, Ned is obviously <sighs> someone that's very conservative and he's. Uh... Hold on a second. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, someone uh, just asked me a question. <laughs> so um, it'll be basic- that, that that'll be a good cut. We'll, we'll, that'll that'll be have be a yeah, good yeah, one yeah. to keep it here. No, no, no. It's uh, someone asked me uh, uh, about the air conditioning. So <laughs> you know, it is a little hot in here. I'm sweating. If you can't tell, but um, yeah. Anyway, so it's uh, for the most part we're um, you know uh, basically. Uh, this Raven service lets everyone know, and yeah. you know they're, it's they're insane. Not, honestly, they're not bashful about uh, what no, they say, not. except for Ned. Ned basically only told Stannis uh, about the bastards, and yep. uh, but that news eventually is going to get out to everybody. And, and yes, it's very interesting. Once that happens, uh, then you know, really, it kind of explains a lot that happens uh, season two, three, you know, four, and and so on. Yeah, um, so you know. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, yeah, ultimately, uh, it ends kind of with this insane, insane kind of closing scene. Ultimately, that is so proclam- proclamative, if you if you will, um, with kind of Joffrey kind of beginning his reign as king and beginning to make his decisions. You know, it, I, I love it too because this episode is kind of the low-key beginning of kind of a big, a lot of proclamations for this one place in the Riverlands known as Harrenhal, which which, which becomes like a, bi- a big set piece in season two ultimately. But if you kind of think about it, it's kind of a useless ruin, basically. And, but but it keeps being granted to all of these lords like it's some kind of like uh, like it's some kind of reward, basically. It's granted to th- it's granted to three different people over the course of I think two seasons before it's kind of largely forgotten about. And the first one, obviously, that is granted to is Janos Slint uh, by Joffrey, famously for his betrayal of Ned. I also like here how basically, like literally two episodes ago, it was Ned sending out um, his sending out soldiers to arrest Gregor Clegane, and now Joffrey's on the throne. Like, it feels like, um, it, it feels like a lot has gone on in, like, a matter of a week. Uh, a question. Was this the episode where, um, you know, basically the head of the King's Watch was, uh, you know, told to go packing? 
Uh, no, that, oh, yes, yes, that actually yeah, does happen. I, yeah, I remember that scene, so. Yeah, he, that, basically, next he names Tywin, Hand of the King, and then basically it ends, they're basically like, yeah, Sir Barristan, uh, you're out. Yeah, that, that uh, sucks, because he, he was basically one of these honorable men, and he got yes. dirty just like Ned did. Yeah, And he basically starts stripping his guard and saying, I'm gonna die a knight, and, <laughs> you know, uh, Littlefinger basically goes, yeah, uh, a naked knight, naked apparently. Knight. <laughs> uh, it still leads to one of my favorite moments, basically, and it's ultimately good to see Barrison walk out of here like a boss. Uh, he he ultimately is absent for a season before he pops up serving Daenerys, and he, he, pr- he proves that he is completely, like, a master of what he does when he pulls his sword and quits in the absolute boss's way by saying, like, hey, our boy, after throwing his sword down, melt it down and add it to the collection, basically kind of stating symbolically that it's nothing more than a symbol of power and that, that of and the people who serve it ultimately receive no glory in the end, kind of. Yeah. And it ultimately, I, I, it, it proves to be a very futile and stupid decision as he ends up going to serve Daenerys later on. Yeah, but I think it also, this is a, a nice little sort of peppering in foreshadowing of like what he's going to do because Barrison is sort of an honorable man yes. just like Ned is. And they're getting rid of him. And so I think the fact that they're doing him dirty in this episode should really clue everybody in to how Ned's going to be done dirty in the next episode. Yes, indeed. It is, like I said, it is the beginning and the setting up of a lot of scenes that will eventually play out in very ugly fashion in the last two episodes. As we have the final sequence being Sansa coming up. And while there still seems to be some good grace left, she pleads to Joffrey for her life for her father's life ultimately i love the excuses that she comes up with because she like she really does put her all into it she really does believe believe this stuff that she's saying because she really has no idea and like she's yeah. so naive and so innocent here that it almost makes me believe it where she's like oh um what's it called his leg was really hurting him uh that he was being manipulated by robert's brothers who wanted the throne that he loved yeah robert. It, it's sansa is such a weird character at this point in this like, season it, yeah it's it, no, she's very one-dimensional. I think. Yes. I think she really but does play thing, the, it well. Yes, but it, she it's plays one it of very things, well. It's one of those things where I don't know if they really had enough plot-wise for her. She's sort of like the damsel in distress that gets you know uh, sort of usurped by Cersei and, and Joffrey, and that's it. She's someone that has to be rescued, and really, that's uh, the only character arc she has this season. Is like innocent girl innocent girl who's captured for ransom. Yep. Pretty much. That's about it. You know, yep. uh, but obviously Sansa becomes, you know, a much more in depth character. Yes. Um, you know, things still tragically happen to her, but ultimately it's a series long arc for her to really be defined, you know, what type of, of woman she becomes. Ultimately, her naivete here is for a purpose, which is why I still get behind it. It definitely feels like it's building up to something like a lot more tragic where she doesn't get the happy ending that she's so dreaming of. And her naivete is kind of thrust aside and broken down in favor of like kind of rough experience that she experiences at the hands of all of her uh, of all of the men in her life with the only good ones seemingly being Tyrion. But supposedly but the episode ends with Joffrey granting her 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 plea of mercy and said but only if Ned proclaims him as the true king and in that way he will be sent off to the wall in order to live out the rest of his days and it kind of ends on that cliffhanger right there with the cut to black so ultimately Pat I wonder what happened what do you think happened in the interlude that caused Joffrey to go back on his word well, was it like the know, show of? Was it like the power <laughs> of the crowd? The show of like like the need to show sh- show strength. Ultimately, was it just like power hungry? Was there something that just snapped well, at that moment? Like what was it? I, I, think? I think for the most part, uh, what we're going to see next episode is the fact that he wants to be a ruthless king, and you know it's he, he does not want to project to his people that he is someone that gives mercy, and so I think that's that's what he's thinking in that moment. And he's just like, nope, you know, there's no mercy here. You do, you do me dirty, uh, you're going to end up dead. So, uh, I think that's his his decision, and he doesn't listen, you know, to Cersei. He doesn't listen to uh, all the other people and, and what they're telling him. Uh, and really, I think you know what we're gonna find is that Joffrey just really doesn't have the uh, political intelligence uh, to really know what he needs to do. He basically is just sort of this ruthless, young, stupid child. 
And, yes. You know, it's he's not going to have enough time to really smarten up. Yes. Ultimately, Joffrey is, again, a tragic character, if not a cruel one, because he's kind of thrust into this position again very, very early and kind of gives in to his deeper urges and ultimately becomes more and more insane as time goes on. But ultimately, more and more just kind of unfavorable because he, in a weird way, becomes like the AJ Soprano of the show in that he's just constantly this figurehead when the real work is being done, obviously, by his grandfather and his mother and his small council, basically. And that's kind of and uh, and that's kind of the reign that we sit through for the next kind of three seasons of the show before things finally shake up, obviously, with his death, ultimately. So I think this was a good episode, ultimately. It's strangely enough, though, it's not one of my favorites. I think that ultimately it feels like there's too much that happens here rather than like me getting some of the rich character moments from the show. I think I have this ranked at like, I think I have this ranked as like my third least of the uh my my yeah my my third lease of the show i have it above the pilot in the fourth episode yeah, but um like what i'm going to say is that with this episode there's a lot of you know uh basically setup uh for th- you know basically the next episode and the final episode but also for the series going forward and this time it doesn't seem as like hard to swallow as like the first couple episodes of the season. Like you really, you know, looking at your watch, looking at your phone, like the first couple episodes are really like, come on, let's speed this up. Yeah. And then by the time we get to like the last couple episodes, it's like, boom, boom, boom. Now we're moving. Yeah. I think a lot of what happens in this episode is interesting and intriguing. And, you know, uh, I think starting us off with uh, the first sword of Bravos, the best character of the show, let's face it. Yeah. Um, you know, in such a, a cool action s- sequence, giving us Drogo in another action sequence. I think they give us enough of the action this episode to really make all the other sort of uh, information type scenes, um, you know, uh, very well, you know, fit. Um, so anyway, I'm ready for it. You know, the gotcha verse, you want to talk about the white walkers. I want to, I want to know more about them. Uh, you know, what the hell are they doing? Where are they right now at this moment, you know, in the show, what's going on? Yeah. The white walkers are still pretty much a mystery at this point, right? We obviously learned their origin later on that they were created by the children of the forest as kind of a weapon to use against the first men when they first entered Westeros and later on obviously they kind of rebelled, but it's weird because they because the room, the legends about the long night say that it lasted for like I think it was it, I think it was like 10 years. I think was when it lasted before the world of men were finally able to fight back against it basically. It was the idea that the white walkers were led by this one figurehead called the Night King and as we see in season 4 with the way that they created They would apparently kidnap human children at night and transform them because apparently they had to be transformed young in order to grow up to become a white walker, essentially. And then they would raise their armies of the dead and wage wars against mankind, basically. But then they went to but apparently they went to sleep and hibernated because they were thrown back by men at first, obviously, with the construction of the wall by Brandon the Builder. But now they've reawoken and now they've returned. And ultimately, we kind of see their overall conquest of Westeros play out ultimately as to how they are summed up as being the overall looming threat. But in a weird way, I think it's one of those situations that kind of works out better in the books because it, it, it because they're so used so minimally within the books. It kind of allows them to become more overwhelming. Like the interesting thing is that the hard home attack that is so prescient in season five of the show is not seen in the books. It's only heard about. It's it's some letters that are written back basically, and it makes it sound like it was a massacre that they basically walked into. That it that it was already like so bad that like they were even overwhelming the ships. Like that's how bad it got. Like they barely got out with any of the wildlings. But it's written in letter form, so it, it does the jaws thing of like kind of building up the anticipation more in your head. And so that's kind of where I think they ultimately go wrong with the White Walkers. I think they kind of become a little bit too hungry with, like, the cool filming they can un- they can unleash without terrifying these things are, basically. So I think that we kind of got a little bit spoiled a little bit early there. Because even though the moment is awesome, it still ultimately kind of peaks them too hard, you know? And so it kind of makes, the, it makes us much more nitpicky when it comes to things like the Long Night or when they attack the Weird Tree or the battle that they have with John's folks when they go north of the wall in season seven. So ultimately, I think that while the concept of them is cool, I I still think that the White Walkers unfortunately kind of fall into the kind of just needing an antagonist for antagonist's sake and that they're kind of just like this unwielding, unmoving force. They don't really have any personality. Uh, They're kind of just blocks, quite literally blocks of ice that move forward for our heroes to overcome. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, for the most part, the show does a really good job of making the White Walkers seem like a legitimate threat. Even up into, you know, episode, uh, what is, I forgot which number, but in season five, the hard home. Of yeah, episode sequence. eight. Yeah, so when when John is sort of surviving and he's on the raft and he's floating away from the army of the dead and the Night King is sort of lifting up his arms and raising uh, the now dead uh, wild It's an awesome moment. Such. It's an awesome moment, but it's also, it gives a little bit of characterization to the Night King that he knows what he's doing and he knows that he's a threat to humanity. But I feel like from that moment going forward to the end of the series... There's really the audience is not clued into anything other than he's just a zombie ready to steamroll uh, the Westeros. And, you know, it would have been nice to have a little more uh, sort of, um, you know, intelligence behind the bad guy, like introduce us to sort of what specific plot. Uh, you know, that the White Walkers have in mind for humans. You know, it's it's almost like they become a silent bad guy and they're just sort of like a juggernaut coming towards them. Yes. And I think that's really, you know, if you were to talk about like a mistake of them just being a bad guy for bad guy's sake, I agree with that. But I think they could have very easily, um, you know, allowed, uh, just had some scenes where the White Walkers are doing a little more strategy and, and you know, really uh, beating the humans back in sort of a way that uh, shows that they have true intelligence and, and make them a little scary in that way. Um, so we'll, yeah, part, we'll find part out of the, because like, I don't, yeah. I, I, those later seasons, even though uh, they're more recent, uh, I still would love to get a second chance to, to check them out and see how I feel. Yeah. Part of the interest ultimately that can't, that comes from kind of, you know, the, continue to push back publication date of the winds of winter is the fact that Martin has stated heavily that he will get into a lot more of the magical subplot and how that factors into the story within the third season that kind of wasn't as prevalent. You know, the interesting thing about magic as far as how it's used is that it kind of goes away the minute that the white walkers die, the, the, the minute that the white walkers are stopped and then it kind of just reverts back to just normalcy, kind of. And that's kind of what li- really kind of makes it even more underwhelming is because, like, Martin has been hinting that, like, there's this one secret, other secret weapon that they potentially could use besides just, like, dragon glass and fire. And there's and, 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 and at the hinting of Euron Greyjoy coming into the show, like, Euron Greyjoy has, I can already tell, has a very different trajectory in the books than in the show. So, like, that's also part of the intrigue there. And so the fact that kind of the show is almost, like, dived away from that, I feel like, you know, that that could also offer up some perspective there as well. So, and wrapping up, we got a few comments, obviously, that we want to hit. Eric, thank you so much for, once again, being the only person to actively, actively contribute to our chat. Uh, yes, indeed. This is where Arya kills for the first time, if you remember it correctly. Um, Sirio is the guy... Could he have survived? His death was off screen. Unfortunately, only because Game of Thrones has broken that if they die off screen, they could still be alive rule three times. First with Sirio, the second time with Stannis, and the third time with um, uh, the Brynn of the Blackfish Tully in season six. Um, I think George is a Marvel Comics fan, LOL. Uh, Robin Aaron. Yes, that's also a thing that I'm glad that he brings up because Robin Aaron famously is one of a couple of people whose names were changed for the show. Uh, his name in the books is Robert Aaron. He is named after Robert Baratheon. And uh, in the show, it is changed to Robin in order to apparently not confuse him with Robert Baratheon. Uh, I don't. I, I don't know why Eric is no, still, I, I think, you know, changing names so they're not matching and just making them a little more individual. Uh, that seems to be a common translation thing from yeah. like, books into to television or movies. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to happen quite frequently, I've seen. Uh, he also says, to be fair about Tyrion being as a prisoner, he was a prisoner of the people on the council. Okay, yeah, but he's still a prisoner. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, whoa, Hard Home is one of the best episodes. And um, Euron is probably the worst character in the show. Yeah, he is not a good character ultimately in the show kind of he's I, I i think there's a reason why kind of the books kept him a lot more of a mysterious character like he's very much in the shadows there's a reason why when we are when we go back to the Greyjoy island we're introduced to his two brothers his two surviving brothers um aaron and victorion and it's victorion who we actually follow west to as the Greyjoy to try and go and team up with daenerys ultimately so before we go of course pat 
we have our little death count ticker to keep track of. And I actually think I did pretty good with the death counter. I, 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 I counted no less than, well, aside from the unanimous ones, as far as named characters go, four named character deaths in this episode and a couple of minor character Man. deaths as well. How many did you catch? I just want to see how many you caught before I read them off. You know, man, it's it's like uh, I know the stable boy died. <laughs> you know, that's uh, one. Yeah, uh, man. Who else? Uh, Serio is presumed dead. Although yes. I, I, I'm holding out hope for him. Um, you know, the whole entire Stark family, which is probably well, not the whole family, but like the ones in King's Landing. So yes. it's probably about forty people right there. Uh, you know. Um, because it's all the guards too that we right. see off off screen, or we never actually see. Who else, man? There's um, it's a lot. Yeah, I don't know. It's I have yeah. three. You you got most of them. I have three more. So I counted the the white corpses, the ones that came alive and attacked okay, them. Yeah, they and I <laughs> yep. And I and you forgot Cal Drogo's blood rider that he whose tongue he ripped out of his throat. Mako. Oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So we have those ones. So our a rest in peace to all of those characters, but still no major main character death yet after two. But we have two more coming this season before. Surprisingly enough, even though season two has a lot of character deaths, like a lot, none of the characters on the main cast die in season two. It's the only season without any main cast member deaths. It's kind of insane. I was always intrigued and impressed by that in A Clash of Kings as well. But uh, mm. Pat, before we get go off the air, do you have anything to tell the people as far as where they um, can follow you on the Instawebs and the yeah, Instagram? Uh, basically, hey, listen, uh, right now I'm just directing everybody to my Instagram, at Patrick W. Huber, H-U-B-E-R. You know, just go there and look at some pictures I already got there. I swear I'll post at some point. It's, it's basically a uh, threat. Uh, you will see something that I post. But for now, go there and otherwise, uh, you know, you can catch me here on the Talking TV uh, YouTube channel. Yes, indeed. And you can find me as well at Movie Nerd Reviews on Facebook and Instagram and on here, the Talking TV channel, posting pretty much three times a week, people. We've got a lot of content coming for you guys this week. We've got our Pixar review of Luca coming this Monday. We also have the final entry on this on the journey to the finish line, the fate of the Furious coming this Wednesday before we review Fast and Furious 9 the following week. Keep tuning in Fridays for the Variety Channel and keep coming back to the channel, obviously, for more content. You can click the subscribe button below. Click the bell next to it. That way you guys can get notified every time we put up new content. Like I said, we put up a lot of content and you can keep up to date with everything by once again following our social media profiles. And as always, people, remember 12 Seasons in a Short Film and for myself and Pat, watch more fucking movies. Yeah, watch more John Cena films. Because <laughs> you're going to watch it if you watch uh, Fast Exactly. <laughs> On the road to the Iron Throne. We'll see you guys later.